Hey, this is John Acuff, and welcome to the All It Takes Google podcast, the best place in the entire world, including all of Canada, to learn how to build new thoughts, new actions, and new results. Today, I'm going to teach you seven ways to deal with rejection. Have you ever have you ever been rejected before? I have, and it is not fun. Not fun at all. But don't worry. Next time it happens, you'll be ready, even if you only do like one of the things I recommend. But first, today's episode is sponsored by MetaShare. Have you guys ever had buyer's remorse? You know, that feeling of intense regret because the thing you thought you just had to have was only something you used once or twice. For me, it was the time I bought a really expensive road bike because I thought I was going to get into cycling. I proceeded to hang it on the wall in my garage and feel ashamed for six months. Well, I know some of you are experiencing buyer's remorse right now for something much more frustrating. You know what I'm talking about. It's the health care you rushed to get during open enrollment last December. Well, I have some good news for you. You've probably heard me talking about our main sponsor for this podcast, MetaShare, and these guys have the answer to healthcare buyer's remorse. Check this out. Members of MetaShare save up to 50% or more per month on their healthcare costs. They say the typical family saves up to $500 per month. And here's the best part. You can become a member at any time. So that means it isn't too late to ditch your buyer's remorse and switch to a more affordable healthcare that will save you money and help you sleep better at night. If this is your first time you're hearing about MetaShare, it is the best alternative to health insurance that allows you to share the burden of medical bills, offers access to 900,000 plus healthcare providers, and has a proven 25-year track record. Plus, in addition to saving hundreds per month as a member of MediShare, you will also have access to free telehealth and free telecounseling. You won't find that with any traditional health insurance provider. Guys, it only takes two minutes to see how much you could save. Go investigate that for yourself and your family at metashare.com slash John. That's metashare.com slash John. Remember, John doesn't have an H in it. So it's M-E-D-I, that's meta, share, S-H-A-R-E, dot com slash J-O-N. All right, let's talk a little about some rejection. Recently, while I was on a podcast, I was being interviewed and the host said, hey, how do you deal with rejection, John? And I said immediately, um, this was my answer, poorly and personally. Um, and then it was quiet because I think they were looking for a longer, more eloquent answer, but that is the honest one. I know there are some other motivational folks who say things like, I don't fail, I just learn, or rejection is an education, but that is, that is not me at least not at first. Like I eventually get there. I do. I eventually learn from the struggle. One of the soundtracks that I like to say, and remember a soundtrack is just my phrase for repetitive thought. One of the soundtracks I like to say is that it'll either be a success or a story. Like it's going to work or I'm going to get a story out of it. But with rejection, it takes me a little while to get there because rejection sucks. I don't know anyone who likes it, who's like, oh, yes, give me more rejection. But it's going, it's going to happen. I mean, to all of us, a lot in small ways and big ways and medium ways. So I thought some more about that question. And because I like lists, I came up with seven ways to deal with rejection. Now, I need to start with a quick disclaimer. I don't do all of these for every rejection I experience. I mean, who has time for that? I'm always highly doubtful when some other motivational person gives you like, these are my simple 37 step morning routines. And I just think there's no way you're doing that every morning. 37 steps, it's too many. I, I just don't believe that. I don't think that's realistic. So let me just say that I'm going to give you a list of seven and I think you're going to hear some of them and go, oh, that one works for me or, oh, that one doesn't work for me. But just know that when I get rejected, I don't sit down with like a list and a chart and I go, let me work through my steps. I go, oh, you know what? This way really helps in this type of rejection or this rejection is big enough that I'm going to do three of these things or four of these things. But I'm not telling you, hey, every time you get rejected, go through this entire list. You're very busy. We're all very busy. But I think that there are seven things you can do when you experience rejection, that will help you get over it a lot faster, that will help you learn from it, and will help take the sting out of it, if you will. So let's talk about the seven things. And I'm going to start with the best. 
You know, I think there's a lot of podcasts where they bury the lead, where they you have to listen to the whole episode to get the absolutely best part of it. That's not what's happening today. Today, I'm going to come right out of the gate with what I think is the best way to deal with rejection. You ready? Number one, share it quickly before it becomes a secret. Let me say it again, because I talk very fast. Share it quickly before it becomes a secret. You have to tell someone else what happened, or it will morph from an event. You experience, you know, an experience, you experience rejection. It'll morph from an event to a secret, to a part of your identity. That's the path rejection goes. It was an event, but then it becomes a secret if you don't tell anybody. And then it can become a part of your identity. And it's not easy to do this. It's not. But sharing a rejection with a friend defangs and declaws the hurt. Now, for me, depending on the size of the rejection or the type of the rejection, I either process it with a friend or maybe even my counselor. So I've got a a series of friends, a collection of friends that I meet with every week. So on Monday mornings, I have a group of entrepreneurs that I meet with. It's virtual. They're from all over the country. And if I had some sort of rejection that was related to running my business, I might share it with them. I might go, hey, you know, here's something I'm working on. You guys understand it. We're all kind of in the same space. I go on morning runs with a friend named Ruben. He's my neighbor. We might talk about it. I walk every week with my buddy named Ben. I've mentioned him before on the podcast. I might share it with Ben. I hang out with a buddy named Al Andrews. I run with some guys named Rob and Justin and Kevin. So I've got a group of people that I can share things with. And I've got guys in my neighborhood that we have coffee, you know, Friday morning. So I have a group of people I can share it with. And I think you need to do that. I think the temptation is to hide it. The temptation is to not admit it hurt. The temptation is to kind of push it down. But I think when you do that, you run the risk of it again, becoming a secret and even getting really sticky to where it becomes part of your identity. So the first thing I think that you should do is share it quickly before it becomes a secret. The second way I think you can deal with rejection is I think you can check it for a lesson. I think it's a valuable thing to say, okay, is there something I would do differently next time? Did I experience this rejection because of something I did? Was I not prepared for a situation and I I felt rejected? You know, like there was a meeting where I was presenting an idea and it didn't go well and the client didn't approve it. And was I not prepared? Did I have the wrong information? Um, Did I really give it my all? I think you can check it for a lesson. Sometimes there is a lesson there. Sometimes it was just not about you at all. Sometimes you got rejected because somebody else is going through something weird or terrible and you were just in the path of their weird and terrible. And it has nothing to do with you. But sometimes there is a lesson. So I'll give you an example from my own life. I recently got rejected from being on a podcast. So there was a podcast I wanted to be on and the host didn't want to have me on it. And that was a rejection. Not a big one, not massive, but it was still a rejection. And so I kind of thought, okay, why did that happen? You know, is there something between me and that person that would make them not want to have me on their podcast? And I, I thought, and the truth is there was, I believe there was. I remembered that probably two years ago, I had disagreed with one of this person's ideas. And I had texted a mutual friend and said, hey, I really don't like this idea. Here's why. And, da, 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 da. and let me say the right word for that. That was gossip. That was petty. That was me probably being jealous of this person and you know being petty and gossiping. And that's not who I want to be. Um, And so in this moment, I thought, oh, this person has a legitimate reason to not have me on their podcast. Like I was a petty jerk. Um, There's a lesson there. That's a legitimate lesson. It's not a fun one. I'm not excited to share that, but it's true. And so in that situation, that particular rejection, I could easily go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The reason that happened was me. Ah, uh, yeah, I, I'm the one that caused that. I'm the one that did that. And, and that was helpful. That was helpful for me to learn that lesson and to say, okay, I don't want to be the type of person that experiences rejection like that, which means I don't want to be the type of person that gossips. I don't want to be petty. I want to deal with whatever jealousy I've got going on with other people. So how do I do that? Um, there was a tweet that I saw that I absolutely loved from a guy named Gerald in reverse. And the tweet, this is the whole tweet. He said, well, 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 if it isn't the consequences of my own actions, 
And that was hilarious to me because it's so true. The longer I spend blaming other people for all my problems, the less time I have to actually fix them. And so in this particular situation, when I dealt with the rejection, I realized, oh, yeah, 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 there's a lesson. And I can learn from that and I can change and I can grow. The third way I think you can deal with rejection is to laugh about it. I think you need to laugh about your rejection. I think it can be really healthy to make fun of the rejection. I have a group of friends that if something goes wrong, I was in this mastermind with a group of friends a couple of years ago. If something goes wrong, we'll screenshot it if there's a rejection and share it and laugh about the situation. And I think that's really healthy. I think it really kind of removes the sting of the rejection when you're able to go, wait a second, that's ridiculous. Like that is the dumbest thing and we can laugh about it. And I'll give you an example from my own life. I had somebody write a review of one of my books. They were important. They were kind of famous. They were like a big kind of known person. And they described one of my books as a pamphlet. And that is like the biggest punch in the stomach to an author. That is the last thing you want to hear is that somebody says, oh, they spent two years writing this thing. And it's ultimately, it's like a pamphlet, like, oh, body blow. And I, I don't know if I've shared that story before, but that was super challenging. My first response to that wasn't like, yay, okay, I'm learning. Like, it wasn't my response at all. But eventually, as I shared it with my wife, as I shared it with friends, I was able to laugh about it. I've even shared it with a group of people that I do um, coaching with. I do group coaching and we joke about it. But now what's funny is my wife, Jenny, will say sometimes, you know, just out of the blue, she'll say, you know, John, you're my favorite pamphlet writer. I just, you write the best pamphlets and we laugh about it. I think that there can be something really powerful about learning to eventually laugh about the rejection. The fourth way that I think you can deal with rejection is to write it out. I think it's helpful to write it out. Now, sometimes I think writers give you advice to write and that's intimidating. My, my wife, Jenny, said that to me once. We were doing it uh, live together on Facebook and she was like, when writers who are naturally engaged in writing go just write a thousand words about whatever, that's intimidating if you're not a writer. It'd be like if somebody said, you know, just sew a blanket or just do your taxes or just if you're struggling, like if you're feeling stressed out, change the oil in your car. I couldn't do that. I don't know. Maybe you can. Like maybe right now you're changing the oil in your car and they're like, this guy doesn't even know how to do stuff with carburetors. I don't, dude. I really don't. So when I say write it out, don't hear me say write a novel, write a chapter. It can be two sentences. It can be three sentences. It doesn't matter. Here's the point. Paper shrinks fear. Let me say that again because it was sexy. Paper shrinks fear. When you've got rejection in your head, when you're dealing with it, it can feel big and massive and kind of just like shapeless and huge. And then when you put it on a piece of paper, it loses its size. You start to say, oh, wait a second. That, that wasn't so bad. Oh, wait a second. That wasn't so big. Oh, wait a second. When I took it out of my imagination, and I put it on the paper, it got a little bit smaller. So I think something that's super helpful is to write it out. When you get rejected, when you experience a rejection, write it out. One sentence, two sentences. Now, if you're a writer and you're like, man, I'm going to do a whole page. Awesome. Do a whole page. Write the amount that fits you, but put it on a piece of paper. The fifth way I think you can deal with rejection is assume it's not personal. Assume it's not personal. What do we start with at the beginning of this podcast? I said that I handle rejection poorly and personally. I'm trying to not take it personally. One of the soundtracks that I use for my life with people is assume they're busy too. Assume they're busy. Why when I text somebody and they don't text me back, I assume it's because they're mad. I assume it's because they're furious or they're unhappy with me. Or maybe I said something like I tell this elaborate story about that, which is a form of overthinking, by the way. Have you ever done that? Have you ever texted somebody and they didn't respond? And then you tell this elaborate story or even worse, they give you like the three bubbles and you're like, well, what, what, what were you going to say? What were the bubble? And then they don't send a text like, and you tell this elaborate story. What if instead you could just assume they're busy? Because when somebody texts me and I don't respond, sometimes it's just because I was at the pool, the neighborhood pool, and I saw it and I opened it and then I forgot it existed. I have two text speeds in general, right away, instantly, or never. Those are the two speeds I have, right away, instantly, or never, ever, ever. And I, I wrote about this once, this kind of, 
funny way I think about texting. I tweeted, is there an emoji for I saw your text, but didn't know how to perfectly respond to it. So I waited until I knew exactly what to say, but it's been three weeks now. So I just feel microburst of shame every time I see your name in the elephant graveyard of messages on my phone. Is there an emoji for that? Would you like that emoji? I know I would, because sometimes that's what happens. I don't know how to perfectly respond. So I go, oh, I don't know. Uh, like, I don't know what to say. So then I just sit on it and sit on it and sit on it. And every time I open my phone, I see your name and I feel terrible, but I just sit on it and sit on it and sit on it until eventually, like, I just never, ever respond. So what if you could assume it's not personal? Maybe the person rejected you because they're just busy. Like they didn't really even reject you. They just didn't respond to your text. Or maybe they're going through something on their own that again, has nothing to do with you. Assume it's not personal. The sixth way I think you can deal with rejection is see it as the ticket price. See it as the ticket price to awesome. No one really criticized me. No one really criticized me when I wasn't writing books. They didn't. Most people didn't know I existed. It wasn't until I started to put stuff out into the world, until I started to write books or write blogs or tweet more or create stuff or launch stuff that then I was exposed to more criticism. Nobody wrote Amazon reviews about my life. You know, nobody was like, hey, I just want to, you know, there's this guy, John, I met. He uh, he works at Auto Trader. I want to kind of review who he is um, publicly in a public forum to give him some feedback. Nobody did that. It wasn't until I started to do something that I actually got criticized. So what if you were able to see, okay, for me to play at the level I want to play, for me to share the things I want to share, for me to launch the things I want to launch, one of the ticket prices is there's going to be some rejection. There's going to be some criticism that comes with that, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to do the thing. I would take every bit of rejection to continue writing books. Like, every bit of rejection to continue putting ideas out into the world. Like I, I would pay that price. I'd pay that price over and over and over again. I would do it and so should you. And, and here's the other thing. There's something interesting when you try to change your life. Your pursuit of your dream is often seen as a direct insult to people who are terrified of their own. Let me, let me say that again because I like to be repetitive. Your pursuit of your dreams is often seen as a direct insult to people who are terrified of their own. If I feel stuck and you start to get unstuck, that feels like, wait a second, why are they able to do it and I'm not? Am I not being brave? And some people take that personally and they they misinterpret that you're just trying to change your life for you. That has nothing like, you're not trying to change your life to show that other person that they're inadequate or they're not enough. But sometimes people feel that way. And they interpret that. So see it as a ticket price. If you decide, okay, I'm going to have a goal because that's what this podcast is all about. Maybe say, you know what? I'm going to get in shape. Like I'm going to get in shape. You're going to be surprised. I promise you that some of your friends won't be supportive and they won't be supportive because they feel like you getting in shape, you changing your life. It's somehow about them and it's really not, but you'd still pay that as a ticket price. Getting in shape is worth a little bit of rejection. Writing a book is worth a little bit of rejection. Starting a business is worth a little bit of rejection. Pay that ticket price. The seventh final way to deal with rejection. I think it's really fun to look up your favorite thing and then read the one-star reviews. Look up your favorite thing on Amazon and read the one-star reviews. And it could be a book, It could be your favorite sunglasses. It could be your favorite watch. It could be your favorite speaker or headphones or anything. Just look up something that you would say, I love this. This thing is amazing. I did that the other day. I looked up one of my favorite books, like top 10 favorite books. And here's one of the one-star reviews. The title was, couldn't even get to the second chapter. Oof. This guy, not happy about this book. He said, it's a boring and lengthy book, simply stretched. Sounds a little bit like a pamphlet. Doesn't keep you engaged. If the reader has to open the dictionary 50 times in a single paragraph, then it's certainly boring and not captivating. Can you guess what book that person was talking about? I mean, okay, so what do we know about it? We know that it's okay. It's, it's really long. Um, it's super boring. The words are complicated and difficult. This person couldn't even make it to the second chapter. I mean, what what book could they possibly be talking about? Well, the book in question is The Great Gatsby, considered one of America's greatest novels ever, 
also a short book. Like no one describes Great Gatsby as long. It's only 47,094 words. Had to look that up. I didn't count them individually. That's not a long book. Brothers Karmazov, is that how you say it? I don't know if that's how you say it. That book is 364,000 words. Great Gatsby is a short book, but this person was like, oh, just the long, it's so boring. I don't even think it's that complicated. The language is pretty accessible. People don't read Great Gatsby and go, I had no idea what was going. It was very complicated. The words were a mess. Like, again, that was one person's opinion. So I think it's a great reminder to remember that you might love something that somebody else rejects, and that's okay. Rejection happens. Those are the seven ways that I think you can deal with it. Number one, let's do a recap. Share it quickly before it becomes a secret. You've got to share it. Number two, check it for a lesson. Maybe there's something to learn. Number three, laugh about it. You've got to make fun of the rejection. Number four, write it out. Write it out. Paper shrinks fear. Number five, assume it's not personal. Maybe it has nothing to do with you. Number six, see it as the ticket price to awesome. Number seven, look up your favorite thing and read the one star reviews. Now, if you liked this episode, like even, even a smidge, you're going to love my new book soundtracks. It's a hilarious, helpful guide to turning overthinking from a super problem into a superpower. And you want to talk about something people overthink, it's rejection. You can buy a copy anywhere books are sold. I read the audio and there's bonus content in the audio. And if right now you're like, "Uh, a whole book, I don't know if I'm ready for that kind of commitment, that kind of relationship. I got that. I got that. Cool. Visit SoundtracksBook.com and you can read the first chapter for free. See if it's for you. All right. That's all for this week. Thank you for all the reviews you've been leaving. They're really encouraging me. If you've got 90 seconds and are feeling a bit generous, please leave one and make sure you subscribe or follow or whatever it is the kids are saying these days so that you don't miss the next episode. I'll see you next week. And remember, all it takes is a goal. This episode of the podcast was brought to you by MetaShare. Text John, J-O-N, to 474747 for more information. Huge thank you to MetaShare for sponsoring it. J-O-N to 474747. Thanks for listening. To learn more about the All It Takes is a Goal podcast and to get access to today's show notes, transcript, and exclusive content from John Acuff, visit acuff.me slash podcast. Thanks again for joining us. Be sure to tune in next week for another episode of the All It Takes is a Goal podcast.